The 101st Airborne Division had spent two months on the bogged down front lines in Holland before being sent to the rear for some well-deserved R&R in Wormelon, France. Fall stretched out toward winter, and the weary and homesick men of the 101st came to terms with the reality of spending another Christmas in Europe. Then, on 16 December, the word came from Belgium that Adolf Hitler had launched a surprise attack through the Ardennes. Eisenhower made two critical decisions on the 17th. One, Ike ordered more than 11,000 trucks of the Red Ball Express that had been hauling supplies in from Normandy Beach to drop whatever they were doing and start hauling his reinforcements to the Ardennes. Two, Eisenhower declared that Bastogne would be the place that has to be held no matter what. He ordered the 82nd and 101st Airborne Divisions be sent in to hold it. For the first time, because of bad weather, the Screaming Eagles went into combat the old-fashioned way, on wheels. We were jammed into cattle trucks, really, as we call them, these big, huge uh, semis with no, no cover on them, just the steel sides. 501 was the lead unit of the 100 person. We pulled out ahead of the others. When the men of the 101st Airborne arrived at Bastogne on December 19th, they were stunned at the sight before them. Marching down the road, heading west, were the defeated troops of the 28th Division. Many had thrown away their weapons. Some were in a hysterical panic to head west away from the oncoming Germans. We had turned everything in and was just waiting to see what we're doing. And then the Battle of the Bulge broke through. And I never saw that many uh, semi-trailers, the, the Air Force, and they brought truckloads of equipment and just dumped it on the ground and said, you all have been there before, get what you need. There wasn't any checking out what weapons, you know. And my guys all had Tommy guns, and we checked out the equipment we needed, and we put us on trucks, and we had a convoy going to, towards Bastogne. And um, it was kind of scary, because here we are going into combat, and the roads were covered with American troops going to the rear, you know. From December 19 on, they tried to overrun the underarmed and supplied paratroopers with overwhelming force of arms.
saying, go back, go back. There's a million of them out there. There's a million of them out there. Our guys all hell, don't worry about it. We're airborne. <laughs> this 101st, we'll take care of it. <laughs> Just barely ahead of the Panzers, the Screaming Eagles and the 10th Armored Division won the race to the Bastogne Crossroads and dug in. Though the Germans surrounded the Americans with overwhelming force, the Yanks' roadblocks in the forest region stalled them. Paratroop units were all on the east, north, and west. And the 327, the gliders primarily on the south. Yeah, but they, had, they threw in everything they had there, the engineers, everybody else, you know, that they could get. But anyhow, that, the way it developed was uh, it took about two days before they finally cut the last road into Bastogne. And that's when somebody said, to, 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 to one of the paratroopers made the immortal remark, well, they got us surrounded, the poor bastards. December 23rd, the skies cleared and the Allied Air Force went into action with a vengeance. Medium bombers swooped in and destroyed the German supply lines. Jabos shot up the German columns and panzers. For the beleaguered Screaming Eagles, the most welcome sight of all was that of C-47 Dakotas loaded with medicine, blankets, ammo, and glorious food. And on the morning that the skies broke that we could get supplies in, I had about a half a belt of ammunition left. With your machine gunner, you can either have a, a carbine, which is a small rifle, or a 45 pistol. I couldn't hit a solid wall with that pistol. So I took the carbine. So I had a half a belt of ammunition left 
and two shells in that carbine. And I done made up my mind that one of those shells in the carbine was for me. Patton's 3rd Army relieved Bastogne at 1650 on 26 December. Charles Bogus drove the first vehicle from the 4th Armored into the lines of the 101st Airborne. He was followed by Captain William Dwight. How are you, General? Dwight asked General McCullough, who had driven out to the perimeter to greet them. Gee, I'm mighty glad to see you, McCullough replied. With the siege broken, the greatest chapter in the short history of the Screaming Eagles came to an end. The defense of Bastogne will go down in history as a triumph of American courage, heart, and determination. But to the Eagles themselves, it was business as usual.